you know, politicians say a week's a long time in politics. I mean, yeah. you say the same in aviation. Yeah. Uh, just tell me one thing in the immediate term, the runway closure, how's that going from your point of view? Are you getting a smooth operation? Uh, it's going really well actually. We are about a quarter of the way through now. Um, I've never seen so many workers, so, many, so much equipment doing a 24-7 job and getting this enormous runway uh, almost rebuilt. And I think of in the United Kingdom how long it takes to do a stretch of motorway they could do with uh, some of these guys helping them. And also, we've got a new runway at uh, Heathrow being built for a Hopefully. £17 billion pound runway. Again, they need to get our friends here to do it for them. And how many aircraft do you actually have to take out for that? Because We've got 46 on the okay. ground right. at the moment. And yeah. what, in terms of a revenue impact, does that have? Is it simply moderated because Ramadan is about to, to start? Or would you ideally not? have to do it to that extent. Well, of course, we would rather keep mm -hmm. going, yeah. but uh, you know, needs must. Um, the, the effect is, uh, it has been significant in the last week or so during the first part of this program, simply because we had the Easter uh, uh, surge, if you can call it that, and therefore we were, uh, fortunately, the flights that we did have still flying were full, um, but it was a pity that perhaps we couldn't have staggered it a bit uh, so that the runway shutdown was perhaps at the end of this month rather than then. But then, again, we had to think about Eid after yeah. Ramadan, about June the 3rd, 4th. So they tried to fix it uh, in, that, in that time period. Okay. Now, you have results coming out, I think, in a, in a few weeks' time. Uh, your, your yearly results last year, you were still profitable, but your half-year results indicated a, a big dent to profitability. Mm -hmm probably can't tell us that much detail about the results as they're yet to be uh, finalized, but what flavors can you uh, tell us about in the last year? I mentioned you know, most airlines have had the challenge of fuel prices, there's certainly been geopolitical factors uh, in, in this part of the world. Yes, I, I, you mentioned fuel, you mentioned currency, geopolitical factors. Mm -hmm. these, have, these are headwinds that uh, we've had to face as Emirates, but the whole industry has. And I remember in, in IATA at the AGM last year in Sydney where I was asked a question about which way the industry would probably go in the next year. And I said there would be multiple failures in the periphery mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the business. And, and that's actually happened. The last, of course, was Jet Airways, which finally uh, went under last week or so, although they're still trying to keep it going one way or the other. So it's, it's not been easy. Uh, in terms of the result, which we will announce within 10 days, um, we're satisfied that with the, all those things I mentioned, we've managed to come ahead in terms of a posit positive result. And the group, although it's not as good as it has been in the past, is actually not a bad, a bad positive result. Well, as you say, you've had those external factors working against you, uh, uh, fuel in particular. And I was thinking, I was looking back for your 10-year results and your know, profitability, if I'm not mistaken, has been there every year at a different <coughs> level, as you said. And I was wondering, actually, how much of that is simply the fact you, you're not a, an airline who has reached its peak and stopped. You're constantly growing. You're, you're adding what, for some airlines, would be their whole fleet, you know, a, a few more 777s, yeah. some more 380s. So there is always that growth factor in adding new and immature markets, I guess, which, again, dampens some of the result. Of course. And, and we, we've lost, during the course of that 10-year period, quite a few of our uh, regional markets, which are high yielding, of mm -hmm. course, when he, I could rattle off a few. And, and they still say, uh, are dormant to us. Um, and the trick then was to uh, expand the network into areas that were not without risk, simply because of the currency movements uh, adverse against the dollar. But nevertheless, we've, we've had to keep going. We haven't been growing at the pace that we used to right. uh, because of the geopolitical uh, issues in the region and elsewhere. Uh, but nevertheless, that's given us time to take stock of what the network is going to look like in the next five or ten years, what the fleet fit to that network is going to be, and the type of aircraft that's going to be fit. So we've spent a good nine months now uh, knocking down the, the, the network in its future size, when it's fit for purpose in what Dubai needs and what the airline needs to go forward, and we are... But, at the end of that exercise now. So we've got a fair idea of what we're going to do now over the next 13 years. Okay. 
I'll come back to that point about mm -hmm. fleet because I think it's going to be a major uh, area of interest. Just one, one thing on fuel, Tim, uh, particularly in this part of the world, fuel price up and down is really a, very much for a carrier like Emirates, a double-edged sword. If a fuel price is down, of course, it saves in operating costs, but it's such a, an underlying source of demand with yeah. the, the oil uh, petroleum extraction uh, industry. What, on balance, is the right place to be with fuel? Well, it's an interesting paradox because, as you said, when the oil prices were high in the past, you get a lot of the hydrocarbon uh, supply chain and all the businesses associated with that traveling regularly. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result of that, you deal with the high fuel cost because your yield is so much better, particularly in the premium cabins. What happened last year when the fuel price came down to $55 the former didn't happen. So we didn't get a kickstart in the hydrocarbon right. industry okay. because I think the investors were taking a, a rather jaundiced medium to long-term view as to whether they would get back into hydrocarbons or just wait and see. And as a result of that, we didn't see the yields really improve. We did see volumes come up for right. other reasons. Uh, so it's, it's anybody's guess as to what may happen. As you say, it's like a yo-yo. Uh, we're having to manage what we do uh, in October of last year, fuel was interplayed at about 180 cents. Today, it's 205. In, April, in May, it'll be 218. So you can see the very the swings that, that have got to uh, we have to deal with. And each cent of increase has a major impact on the uh, bottom line. So, you know, and I think not easy. I may have got this wrong, Tim, but haven't you always said that you saw fuel long term at roughly 75, was it about $75 a barrel, which is more or less where it is I, fluctuating? I've moment. always thought, frankly, I think 70 is too much. Right. Um, and I think the global economy needs to recognize that with the, the, the supply dynamic changing, particularly as you've now got this per Permian Basin producing large amounts of shale that the supply side of the, the equation has completely changed. Now, what you're getting at the moment is anomalies. You've got Venezuela, you've got Libya, you've got bits of Syria. These are causing spikes. But if you get a degree of stability, uh, I think we should be working between 50 and 60. I did say 70 for many years right, okay. when I was hoping that the yield would stay high in the premium cabins for the reasons I just said. Now I'm saying 50 to 60 would do very nicely. Thank you very much if anybody's listening. And at biofuels, do you think they're really going to become a serious uh, contributor to airline fuel requirements in the, the short to medium term? Yeah, I, I, we, we are a, a, a company that does the environmental thing mm -hmm. really well. We, we take it very seriously. In terms of the uh, power that you can derive from biofuels on the scale that you need to supply the industry, we're nowhere near that yet. Um, I'm not saying it's early days, mm -hmm. but... Um, there are lots of other things the industry can do with regard to uh, neutralizing its carbon footprint over time. The engines and fuel are one of those things, but we have low-hanging fruit, which we should go for first. Okay. Coming back to some of those broader themes of uh, geopolitical, we're both Brits. Uh, maybe you managed to spend more time away from the old mother country than I do, but of course, hmm. the Brexit subject is still going on, uh, good or bad, it should have been put to bed uh, you know, a few weeks ago. Do you perceive that's having an effect uh, or a balance of effects on your, your business in general or business in and out of the UK market? Um, surprisingly, we've, we've, we, our demand has been robust in mm -hmm. the European markets. I think people have just got a little bit fed up with what's been going on. But don't forget, it's not just about Brexit. Uh, the European project is, is a challenge project and yeah. we can see now the way the politics are playing out in, in Europe and will do over the next week, uh, two, three weeks until we get the European elections. So there is a degree of uh, instability in the market. But one thing's for sure, the leisure segments, probably because of that, remain fairly strong. Mm -hmm. Although I do hear that the Brits are staying in England because they think they're going to get a summer that they got last no, year, last this year. staycation <laughs> thing. That's not evident in our forward bookings. We're looking to, to, uh, at a very robust set of uh, figures for June, July, August, and September. 
I was talking to a couple of UK airports and they were saying, uh, you know, the London market inbound was quite buoyant because, you know, the pound being down, London yeah. is exceptional value, but that may not be the same case in the regions, uh, like Scotland, for example. Well, actually, with our Edinburgh flight, mm -hmm. which we opened in September of last year, we've just put the 380 into Glasgow. Yeah. Um, so we're now the national carrier of Scotland. Um, I think the, the fact that we've done that yes. and the, the response has been particularly strong. So the Scottish markets, uh, both sides, Glasgow and Edinburgh, are doing well mm -hmm. and I think they're going to continue to do that. Well, it's interesting because when I saw you put the 380 on Glasgow, I thought that was a temporary thing while the runway closure was in place and reducing mm -hmm. from two to one a day, but you've actually got it on, I think, till beginning or end of September. So yeah. you're giving it quite yeah, a good we'll, run. We'll uh, watch how it goes. So far, yeah. so good. And Edinburgh, as you say, has joined the, the pack in Scotland. Mm -hmm. and that, that hasn't diluted Glasgow. No, Scotland. no, there's been a certain amount of shift. I mean, people yeah. have never in Edinburgh really liked to go to Glasgow to pick up flights. We know no. about that. So they will be very pleased to take up the Edinburgh slap. But nevertheless, Glasgow was growing so that we put a second flight on and now we changed one of those into a 380. So good story so far. Absolutely. Other challenges, uh, US-China trade war, a bit of a movable feast. It seems to have quietened down. It seems like maybe progress has been made between the two sides. Is that something you see in demand uh, uh, figures, especially for business well, uh, travel? Uh, you know, it, it, it's important that there is a conclusion to it. Yeah. Uh, because global investor confidence is, is causing, or lack of it, I should say, is causing a, a little bit of a slowdown. And to add to that potential fuel price increases, and we, we're, we're in a pretty fragile state at the moment as the global economy. If the Chinese and the Americans get a reset with regard to trade in place, um, then I think we've got a fighting chance of seeing, seeing the global economy starting to move. At the moment, everybody's biting their nails thinking what's going to happen. Uh, so you, the, in, in freight, for instance, surprisingly, despite all of this, we've had a very strong year in cargo, mm -hmm. air cargo. So again, there are some paradoxes out there, but nevertheless, I think the global economy does need a little bit of TLC at the moment. It would help if the Chinese and the Americans agreed something. Let's see what happens. And uh, the US again, uh, since we had the, the current incumbent in the White House, we had a lot of noise, I think uh, not long after we were speaking last time, possibly in London, uh, really affecting carriers like Emirates, both in terms of security policy, uh, what items could be carried on board. Se separately, the US big three, so to speak, a lobbying campaign about Gulf carriers uh, uh, in terms of competition. Has that gone away or at least quietened down? Uh, the security issue seems to have been uh, addressed. I think on that particular point, um, we are very, very compliant, more than 150% compliant with what home security, t Homeland Security, TSA require. We have a very strong relationship between our group security in, in company and the authorities in the United States. And I think we tick the box in just about everywhere that they require us to do. So we're not concerned about that. As far as the aeropolitical side of things is concerned, I think the American focus is somewhere else at the moment. Um, and uh, the, the notion that um, they keep on banging on about subsidies and Gulf carriers, et cetera, et cetera, it's when the noise stops that I worry. Mm -hmm. It hasn't, so I'm not worried. Okay. And I see you know, there are other carriers that are maybe getting more, more attention in this part of the world at the moment who are investing in other carriers outside the region and then flying to the US. So, so maybe that's drawing some yeah, attention. Yeah, well, that's the refocus. Yes. Um, in terms of uh, Fifth Freedom operations, that was, uh, that was one of the points that was argued about. And, uh, did Emirates say, right, we, we, we're not going to do more at the present time, or has there been an actual agreement uh, to say that would be a more limited uh, line of uh, development in the future? No, actually, um, this, this was uh, misconstrued. That's putting it mildly. The uh, record of discussions as a result of the meetings we had with the United States basically restated the agreement that we already have with the United States, which is an open skies agreement in all areas. And both parties, both the United Arab Emirates and the US, said we want this to continue. No such undertakings were given with regard to uh, Fifth Freedom operations. And we remain uh, able to mount those as and when 
we wish to. Uh, and, and the Milan New York operation on our daily 380 and the Athens and Newark operation on our 777 300ER daily are both doing extremely well. The temptation is to do more. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, we are, uh, as I said, uh, the reevaluation of the routes, the, the network, shape, size, fit is all under the microscope at the moment. As I said, we're closing out on that. Is that going to say that we will no longer look at fifth freedoms across the North Atlantic or elsewhere? No, it doesn't. Or elsewhere, we could do it where we have the aeropolitical rights to do it. And where we see gaps in the market, let's be quite clear, between Athens and Newark, when we started flying, there were no flights between Greece and the United States, mm -hmm. full stop, in the winter of every year. Everybody had to go over intermediate European points. In the case of Malpensa, New York, they also stopped flying. The United States carries. Alitalia was never there. So these were huge holes in the market, which we simply stepped in and filled. And uh, that's the kind of basis of what we look at in mm -hmm. the future. I mean, Af Athens, I think, is a, it's a very interesting European airport because, of course, it's had to deal at a country level with the so sovereign debt crisis. The old Olympic Airways airlines disappeared, ending up being subsumed into a smaller uh, private carrier. Yet their success seems to me, as an airport, which must uh, help the economy, precisely because they've been so open. They've worked with you, they've worked with other carriers from the region, they've got, I think, all the major European ca low-cost yeah. carriers have got bases now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, I wonder if it's a model to other airports that are languishing with maybe a weak home carrier that's doing very little for them. I think that's absolutely right. And there, there are other examples that follow the same kind of model. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the multiplier effects, economic multiplier effects of civil aviation on a, on a, a, a country such as Greece or others is clear, measurable, and has been uh, spelt out in many, many ways in the past. Greece is no exception to that. Yes, it had, has had and still has a number of problems, uh, but as you rightly say, they, they saw the light with regard to the Arab political access, realizing that people, foreigners, tourists, business, drive the Greek economy, so it makes a lot of sense to invite as many as they can get in to do just that. And that's where they've been very successful. Because it's interesting as well. I mean, uh, Greece is a part of the EU. Just coming back to my reflections about Brexit, I wonder if we're going to get a two-speed or two-attitude Europe. Assuming the UK does indeed do what the vote mandated to leave, and the UK having always been very open to competition and freedom of entry, Whereas other people, particularly on the French side and German side, being so much against it, I wonder if this is going to lead to a slowdown or more efforts in what is left of the, the EU to, again, close the doors on people like yourselves to further develop. Well, I, I don't know. I, the, the United Kingdom is one of those countries that has recognized the criticality of air service agreement, whether they're protecting their national carrier, which, by the way, is a public listed company. Uh, so they're not really interested in looking after the interests of British Airways as a government. What they are interested in looking at is the well-being and the development of the United Kingdom economy, including Scotland. Um, so that they, they, the fact that we have 19 flights a day into the United Kingdom, most of those are 380s. <laughs> uh, when you look at our, our French operation or our German operation, they're significantly smaller. Then you look at the way the United Kingdom economy Brexit notwithstanding has moved in the last few years. It's really outperforming all forecasts, including the government of the Bank of England. Um, and uh, it, it, this is part and parcel to mm -hmm. the openness of the UK. So as they move beyond Brexit, if they ever get past that, the, the DNA of the United Kingdom is openness and willing to, to engage and get business done. If the Europeans choose to go the other way, and that could have an effect on the era political access to multiple countries within the European Union, it'll only slow them down and, and, and actually their pace of growth will be retarded as a result of that. They have enough problems at the moment. We're trying to get this project to work mm -hmm. uh, with 27 countries, well, 28 if you call the United Kingdom in it. Um, the, 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 the smart thing to do is open it up as best they can and, uh, and, and take the risks with mm -hmm. regard to preservation of national carriers, if that's what they want to do. But the benefits 
seriously outweigh doing that by all the things I've talked about. Well, and another thing that, that made me think of in Brexit, this uh, one of the challenges that, uh, in particular, of course, UK registered carriers have had is the issue about uh, ownership and control and EU shareholders and traffic rights and so on. And uh, IAG, who's been somewhat in the spotlight of some journalists about whether they are accepted in terms of their current structure as far as the EU is concerned, you know, Woody Walsh has, of course, said this is anachronistic, this era of who owns what. It's, it's of the past. Absolutely. And I noted that the UK government, who, who you, I'm sure you've read the whole document, the uh, Aviation Policy Review, is taking that same view. And it, it does seem amazing to me. We're in, a, in an industry which is truly global. It's all about global every day. Yet we have this localization and this fixation about ownership. What is your view well, on the way that will play you know, out, Tim? I, I don't know. I, I've been in this business an awful long time now. And in that time, I've seen the globalization, liberalization, uh, and reset of thinking with, over the last 20, 30 years, and how multiple industries have globalized, internationalized. You've seen the M&A cross-border going on in telecoms, mm -hmm. in power and utilities, in banking, just about everywhere else. But there is this block, I don't know what it is, that the airline industry cannot be part of that and therefore uh, you'll get the likes of uh, Rod Eddington who preceded uh, Willie Walsh as mm -hmm. the CEO of British Airways and latterly Willie is saying exactly that. This is a global industry. It needs to be invested quite heavily. It has a very high capital level of capital investment and the more access you give to foreign investors and therefore ownership, equity holders in those countries, the easier it is to raise the money that you need to do this. If you are constrained by sovereign requirements, then it, it shapes the DNA of the way people think in that particular business. Not only in the airlines that are representing the countries that they come from, but in the DNA of the civil servants mm -hmm. and the the government entities that are directly engaged or spliced into the aviation sector. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's always been there. And one thing we did with Emirates right from the start, and I go back 36, 37 years now, was we realized that this era political structure, this think, needed to be changed. And we, we banged on about the multilateral approach to era politics. And we were able to persuade a number of governments, and latterly the Americans created the new liberal approach to air, open skies in the early 90s, and that caught on, fortunately. Now you're seeing a little bit of a... Kind of kickback. A little bit. Um, that has to be dealt with, mm -hmm. but part of the casual, one of the casualties of that is people are starting to look at ownership, control, and say, actually, no, we really want to keep it in the hands of our citizens. Mm -hmm. So is that going to go away in the future? I think we have a bit of ground to make before that changes. One hopes that there will be liberal thinkers, people who will drive the thought in how all this is going to work, and they will get listened to. At the moment, there is a concern on the west of the North Atlantic, mm -hmm. where we see things going slightly the other way, and the European project, um, which also has its issues, as I said, and uh, we have a resurgent China, um, which is, has its own agenda with regard to what it does with its carriers. So all this is changing and causing a little bit of concern amongst certain governments. Well, you alluded to, to jet earlier on in India. I mean, that, uh, again, there's another market which on the one has, has phenomenal potential. We've mm. seen some of it, you participate in it, but it looks like again, it has a long way to go in terms of the regulatory approach. We have Air India still being propped up you know, by the state. We have complexity about traffic rights for bilaterals uh, that still, though they've opened up, are not completely open. Uh, jet, if I understood you rightly, it's not likely to come back. It doesn't look to me like it's going to. Um, but I think I was reading a theory was quoted the other day saying, well, we're up to what we're allowed to do bilaterally. Yeah. You know, I saw BA is going to put some extra Mumbai frequencies on yeah. London by 
taking capacity from elsewhere. Uh, what, what's your view on the Indian market? I mean, it's an important one to you, and you could do a lot more for it, I guess. Well, I, I, all I can say is, is it's one of the fastest growing markets in the world. Its GDP remains in, in, a good, in the, the right place. Um, they've got elections going at the moment. Let's assume that this current government gets a renewed mandate. Um, there's a lot of things moving in India, except area politics. Uh, and everything else, India drives and leads uh, technologies, um, uh, uh, services, uh, as, as a country that should be at the forefront. I cannot for the life of me understand why era, uh, the era political barriers or restrictions are still there for all the reasons I mentioned about the multiplier effects. The more you let in, particularly if your national carrier is struggling, uh, and you feel that protecting the national carrier is more important. I'm not quite sure where that works. Uh, it is clear that when the low-cost carriers came onto the Indian market, Indigo, uh, of course, Jet was one of the forerunners in the full-service operation there, latterly Spice Jet, there have been casualties. Um, Kingfisher was one. Mm -hmm. Sahara, if you think back in those days, Spice Jet itself was, it, was a casualty at one point. It's surprising that it can't seem to work. Within the domestic market, yeah, it's difficult because they're all at each other's throats. Of the international market, the demand in and out of India is huge. And uh, so, as Thierry Antinori said recently, we are right up to cap. Uh, we'd love to double the cap if we could, but it's in the hands of the government. And hopefully, we can persuade them. I mean, sure, this has surely got to be a pivotal moment. They're struggling on with Air India, Jet. You know, nobody's interested to go in. Well, ass assumedly not. We'll see you in the next few weeks. Uh, it, it's going to be the ripe time, ripe and right time for them to actually. Uh, well, I, all I can say is approach. we're on it, yeah. and we will pursue this. Let's once the uh, election dust has settled, mm -hmm. whichever government gets in, uh, we will be there to say, look, you know, if you, why would you do this? There are a mm. lot. We can demonstrate how much business we bring to and from India, not just from Dubai, but that's pretty robust, but beyond, which the Indian carriers do not serve. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, other carriers do not serve to the level of frequency and production and style and product that Emirates does. And it's a brand that is hugely aspired to by the Indian traveling public um, because it is one of great quality. I'm not blowing the trumpet of Emirates too much, but it is great quality, it's reliable, it is a it is a high frequency operation to many of the points out beyond Dubai that they can rely on getting to. Um, so we can bring people from 10 or 11 stations. And if you bring Fly Dubai's network into that as well, we have a prolific presence. And we can actually do a lot more than we're doing at the moment, if they let us. And linking to another growing economy, uh, well, actually, Africa and China. I mean, China, you mentioned, uh, you know, it's, it's just a powerhouse. It's hard to comprehend the, the growth there in traffic. Um, do you see that more as a threat or an opportunity to you? Because I think one of the first times we met, I remember you telling me when you'd launched your Shanghai flight, that it went to, I think, a 90% load factor mm -hmm. in about three months. And of course, it wasn't Chinese Dubai traffic. It was Chinese Africa tapping into your wide Africa network. But do you worry in any way that you may see, uh, as the Chinese airlines develop themselves, traffic bypassing Dubai? Or do you think the market has just got so much growth potential in it that you can continue to benefit whatever direct capacity they well, may I, I, I'm, I'm of the latter view. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the growth of the Chinese market outbound is quite extraordinary. In the multi-segment, multi-faceted uh, side of all the demand segments we're facing, Leisure is one, mm -hmm. which is huge. Um, we've, we are restricted to a number of cities and, of course, a number of flights. And we have been trying to persuade the Chinese to allow us more cities with more flights, simply because the pie is growing. Now, when China was running at a GDP of 16% five years ago, this was unheard of in, in any kind of uh, economy on the planet. It's now running at six, maybe four. But when a, an economy the size of China runs at 6%. That's an awful lot of mm -hmm. uh, goods and services right. and activity yes. going on. And that meant people are going into China and out of China. So the Chinese government recognized that really the Chinese carriers needed to do a better job internationally. 
Uh, they also had embarked on a huge airport building program which facilitated the, the growth and that continues apace. So you are seeing more Chinese carriers coming out of China, going to places that we do bring people to. Does that mean that we are, it's a diminishing cake or the cake is remaining remain the same? It's not, mm -hmm. it's a growing cake. Now if this One Belt, One Road initiative uh, kicks in to the level that the participants wish it to, that'll engender an awful lot more of goods and services and trade between the countries involved in the One Belt, One Road scene and China itself, and amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, I remain optimistic that notwithstanding the comments I made about the global economy earlier, this is one thing plus a reset with America that may actually push the global economy into growth again. And Africa, very different. I mean, a vast population, but you know, we could just talk the rest of the day about the challenges in terms of the politics, the infrastructure, the lack of will, and certainly lack of open skies there. But often between African countries, where the, the complaint out of Africa is, well, if I want to go from one city in one country, I've got to go uh, via Dubai to get to another African country or via the UK. Yeah. Uh, are you optimistic Africa now that the African Union is getting behind a liberalized approach and supported by people like IATA, we might start to see some progress on that continent too. Well, I, I can't speak for infra-Africa. Yeah. Um, they, they, irrespective of the, of the good words coming out of the OAU and everywhere else, when it actually gets down to brass tacks, and uh, I say Kenya wants to do a, 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 an aeropolitical deal with Guinea, you get difficulties. So we, they have been talking about this for many years, and uh, the, the, the Africans that wish to do business outside Africa and within Africa, outside Africa there are airlines like ourselves who mm. will take them to the markets, shift their goods and services with our cargo operation as well. Within Africa, you're absolutely right, they're still going from Johannesburg to get to, to Lagos over Dubai and other places. Is that going to change? Much will depend on them. They can only control their own destiny. Walking the talk is important, um, and, uh, they, and, and once that happens, you see the likes of Kenya Airways, Ethiopian, internationalizing their business models, not dissimilar to what we're doing at the moment with Emirates, although, you know, one assumes that eventually they'll get themselves onto commercial profitable voting without the government support, but their thinking is right with, with, with regard to where they are in terms of meeting the demands of the uh, African nations as well as where the markets are and where, what's being delivered. So it'll be, it's, it's, it's an interesting one, Africa. It's still very high yielding. It's still uh, problematical in certain areas for the reasons that you've said. And uh, you, you go there with your eyes open. Mm -hmm. Operations are not easy. Airport operations are difficult. Uh, crew accommodation downline in some of the cities we fly to are not without risk. So we have to de-risk that whole situation before we enter these particular routes. But as far as demand is concerned, very strong, good yields, and strong in cargo. And I, I guess whether it's China, India, or Africa, you, know, you hear, hear airlines on, on all of those continents sometimes say, well, the, the, the Gulf carriers or European hub carriers or whoever are, are eating our lunch. But I guess the issue there, it, it, without repeating what we've said, is more of a regulatory environment. They're shackled by a bad regulatory environment. So even if they want to, with few exceptions, they can't get on and you know, fight back in their own capacity or take their, what they would see as their biggest share they could have. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. I mean, I can't speak for the African carriers. Mm -hmm. They've got a lot stacked against them. Their, their skies are open on a reciprocal basis. They can fly to Europe as much as the European carriers or the Gulf carriers can fly to their countries. Um, if the opportunity is not taken, it's likely that others will take them. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you need to fight back. You need to sort of sort out what your airline is going to do, what, it, what you want it to do for you, and take the risk and get on with the job. If you c continue to retreat from markets uh, and re retreat from competition, in the end, you'll get nowhere, and you'll end up with no airline at all. One mm -hmm. saw it in Ghana, one saw it in Nigeria. Um, and other places on the African continent. Nigeria should have its own airline and be a very profitable one, given what should be going on there. Equally, Ghana should. There are many countries there that 
could form an airline, focus on what it is that the airline should be doing for them, create a set of products that are compatible with their competition. Just get on with the job. But there are other forces at play. Uh, you mentioned a uh, network overall, Tim. You've been, uh, well, still are putting it through the microscope now. You're pretty clear about what you want to do uh, over the next 13 years. Any other more broad points worth bringing out at this moment uh, on network that you would like to uh, mention, or perhaps you would prefer not, not to mention? Uh, not really. I, I, you know, I, I can't really divulge what we're up yeah. to because you know there are lots of people. In the old days, nobody, nobody was really interested. Now everybody's interested. So we have to be a little bit circumspect about what, what we disclose. Um, it, it, I will say this, it is an, uh, a network that sees expansion of the business, it sees expansion of the network points, it sees expansion of the fleet, notwithstanding the demise of the 380, um, which by the way is going to be here till the mid 30s, so don't think it's going tomorrow, a bit like the Concorde disappeared. No, it's going to be out there for a long time and we still have 14 more to take from Toulouse. Um, but I think it's, it's um, we're going to hone what we do at the hub to try and improve the, the way we handle our passengers at the hub, given that we have enormous competition with the likes of Changi. Turkey have just opened one. Our friends in Itihad are just opening their midfield uh, uh, airport uh, either this year or next year. I'm not altogether sure. So we've got to do better at the airport, and we will be employing uh, technology to as rapidly as we can. Biometrics is, is the de rigueur at the moment with regard to airport operations and I would like to see that advance and enhance and accelerated so that the elapsed time that people transiting the Dubai hub uh, are compatible with some of the uh, other competing hubs. So we've got to do more work, work there and how we organize that hub and how we at the same time keep the unit customer operating the hub uh, in equilibrium going forward is vital to us. So what we're trying to do is maintain and grow our network, make it easier in the heart of the network to have mm -hmm. to work more smoothly. And I think we've done great, we've made great uh, strides in that. And get the thing more cohesive because we have a lot of competition around us. Um, and uh, a lot of money being thrown at those entities around us, um, so we've just got to be smart about what we do. What, what about, I mean, uh, you've mentioned before, and we've discussed you know, long haul, low cost. I remember uh, you talked in the past about, you know, somebody could have got an A380 and put 870 seats and had a fant fantastically low unit cost. So far, nobody's done it, not even the one uh, charter operator, but we still, we're seeing more long haul, low cost, and it seems to me, yeah, there's no doubt it's a customer success. But nobody's made any money out of it so far. I mean, AirAsia X has been through different management teams and on routes, off routes. Norwegian is still battling on against a whole host of challenges. We've seen some smaller European ones, most recently, wow, go to the wall. Do, do you see that one being more of a, an incursion into your traffic? And do you think somebody is going to get it to a profitable basis well, of operation? Uh, look, it's early days. You've got the likes of Scoot in the east. Yeah. Uh, you're right about Norwegian. Norwegian is is a carrier that the, the model is perfectly mm -hmm. okay. It's the tools that they use for the model and the cost of those tools yeah. which are probably going to affect what they're doing and we've read all about that. Is the long haul low cost business model one that is workable? Yes, I believe it to be. Is that notwithstanding the the uh, price of fuel? Because this is, this is seriously damaging. One of the main problems with that business model is that others will challenge it mm -hmm. using things like the 380. So it would be relatively easy for us to construct an inventory on the main deck to offer a low cost long haul yeah. product, which would basically be seat only. And everything after that you pay. So you have a choice of seat only, you could then have normal economy, and premium economy. So the range of products, given the number, the amount of inventory we have on a 380, and to a lesser extent on the 777-300s mm -hmm. and the X is coming, allows us to eat into that market. And we see still, something on the North Atlantic, aren't we? Some of these basic fares. Well, you've seen, uh, uh, you've seen IAG do it. Yeah. Um, I think it won't be long before the others follow. And others have set up their own, like Level, and mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what's happened to June. I think that's dying. I think June's going. Going, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that didn't work because it, because anyway, we won't talk about that. But the fact of the matter is, there are ways and means of doing this. 
which is why I've, I've always been such a believer in the 380, in that it has enormous versatility to create a suite of products that meet the demand of the segments that have come to the travel industry over the last 20 years. In the old days, it was fairly channeled, and certain segments were re relied on mm -hmm. them to do it. Now there's, a, there's a, the 7 billion people. <laughs> Not all of them will be able to travel by air, but when they get going, watch out. You've got to be ready for them. Now, you mentioned in that uh, line of uh, discussion about the 380, uh, we, we can't not dwell a few more minutes on that mm. fine aircraft. Now, you, you've always been a fan. You know, without, I suppose, in reality, both ways. Without the 380, Emirates wouldn't be where it is today. Without Emirates, the 380 would not have got to the, the level of uh, uh, success in the market that it's had from a customer point of view. But finally, it was yourselves, you could say, who dealt the death knell to it when you revised your order and switched to uh, 350 and 330s uh, recently, reduced the expected uh, backlog. I mean, uh, as you said, it's no doubt a popular aircraft. For you, it's always seemed the economics work extremely well and will continue to do so. And I've always also bought into the hypothesis that Airbus has used about airports becoming full, particularly out in Asia. Yeah. And if you want to move more people in on one slot, you're going to have to use a 380. But it hasn't happened. Uh, do you still think this is because of uh, conservatism in airline boardrooms? Or is it that if we go back from when you first ordered the aircraft to today, we're worlds apart in what else is now available that wasn't available at the time, the, the big twins? the intermediate twins and the engine efficiencies that, that have come with that? Um, in, in answer to the basically the first point, is there a place for the 380 in the future? Is airport constraint, are airport constraints going to be something that the airline industry has got to deal with? If you accept the IATA forecast and demand, we've got three to 400 million people, passengers a year, passenger segments coming to the business. So if you roll that out 10 years, do the maths. This cannot be dealt with within the primary hubs that people wish to travel to. And the 380 was the obvious answer for that. So I remain convinced that uh, certainly in the next three, five, seven years, this aircraft will, unfortunately, can I say it, because it's going to come into its own. Mm -hmm. Today, we Emirates has six 380s flying into Heathrow. They are full. In the fullness of time, those 380s are going to be replaced by 7779s, which are 360, 370 seaters as against 517. They won't come until the 380 has to be removed by the mid-30s. So here we are with demand growing along the lines that I've said, particularly after the strong, uh, stronger U the European economy, mm -hmm. say the UK, and there will come a time, because slots aren't available, that we actually, in 15 years, have to downsize by as much as 30%. And if you do a linear extrapolation of demand for the flights that we have, we should either have aircraft that are 1,000 seaters or have 12 slots at Heathrow. Both are not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, what does this mean? It means that the cost of airfares will rise as supply is restricted. And um, therefore, for the traveling public who've never had it so good over the last 15 years in terms of the affordability of airfares, that may, may change as this conservatism kicks in. And that's a real pity because it's not just about the airlines themselves. Mm -hmm. It's about, as I said earlier, the multiply effects on business, on tourism, on all the pillars of economy that rely on something like air, air transport to drive a lot of the things that go on. As far as the 380 is concerned, one of the reasons we took the decision to question whether it was going to be about what, uh, whether it was going to continue in our fleet, if you roll back the clock to 2013 when we ordered our last 50, the first tranche of 25 were due for for to add, which no. is what we've done. The back 25 were replace. to replace uh, and renew the same fleet. Yeah. And at the time, we were promised by Airbus a new aeroplane. Aerodynamically, it was much more uh, potent. It had a, re a finessed wing. It had new propulsion. It was much lighter. For instance, the, the fin, the tailplane, was reduced in size. Um, so we had an aircraft that I thought was going to deliver between 10 and 13% reduction in the cost of its operation. 
Uh, Rolls-Royce equally were there to help us out in trying to improve the, air, the engine that we bought. Unfortunately, none of this happened. And what we were left with um, was a continuation of the aircraft that had been essentially designed and built in the late 90s and mm -hmm. the early part of the last decade. And going forward, bearing in mind that we have the new twins coming out and latterly the new single aisles, we saw a mismatch in the way those aircraft performed in the sweet spot of their aerodynamics propulsion and therefore the bottom line is against what the old 380 was doing. So if you measured the uh, unit cost per seat mile, seat kilometer, on the new twins is against the 380, it was out of line. That required us to be smarter about increasing and improving the quality of the business on the 380. Mm -hmm. And we have, we've been particularly successful at showers and bars. It's all done for a reason. It's not a vanity project. We've done that Pays because it, it is certainly payback in many ways. And we continue to do that and will continue to do that. But the other thing that was worrying me personally was its environmental footprint. Um, to, to have an aircraft that was designed and built using propulsion technology of the late 90s, early 2000s was not going to pass muster with regard to the concern we have about getting the, uh, our environmental footprint down. Mm -hmm. And it would be very difficult for us to stand up in 2027, 20, 28, saying we were using engines that were designed and built in the mid-2000s, uh, etc. So all this um, suggested that we needed to chart another course, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Uh, but nevertheless, we will continue to operate those aircraft uh, for the next 15, 20 years. Unless, well, I can only say if I was there, yes. <laughs> but they'll have to have a wheelchair up to them, I think, or a ramp, <laughs> something to get me in there. Yeah. But I mean, the other aircraft that are coming in, I mean, the, as you said, the 777X, the, the new version of the, the, the trusty uh, 777, uh, especially 300 long haul, you're going down, going back where you were anyway, uh, with smaller uh, wide bodies and with the 330s, the 350s, the 787s coming in. And the industry as well, you know, all we hear about is uh, long haul narrow bodies with 321 LRs and 737 Maxes. But again, it seems to me it's, it's hard to predict exactly the trajectory because the capacity is huge. You know, maybe everybody wants a local airport on a small, risk-free or lower risk aircraft, but there isn't the capacity to support all of that. I, I, I agree. I, what can I say? I can only say that after the great financial crisis of 2007, 2008, 2009, the mix of management and boards in the airline industry changed. Um, and there was a whole approach which was de-risk the business. Mm -hmm. De-risk the business as far as shareholders are concerned, share value, market cap, etc., etc. And the smartest way to do that was downside and do not take on aircraft that have high upfront capital costs, cost a lot of money if you don't believe uh, they're going to be, your marketing commercial teams are going to be able to fill them. So you see the growth of the single aisle in terms of basically derivatives uh, and the 321 Neo LR was the, the latest one of those, the Max was another one um, and these are coming in at a time where they are increasing range, uh, they are hoping to tick the box with regard to the points that they link and therefore that's okay. What worries me is that you, there is no room for growth in all of this. And it's about time that the manufacturers turned their attention to the short and medium uh, range aircraft to, to, to do what it is that the, the basically what the traveling public wants mm -hmm. under the design rules that they are so good at doing these days to get a, and optimize a new aircraft. Now, you've seen Boeing with what they call the NMA, the new midsize aircraft, quite where that's going at the moment. But that is the kind of thing that needs to go on. You can continue building derivatives for so long. But in the end, the derivative aer aerodynamics are going to bite you where you don't want to be bitten. And you have to make the changes. These days, with the development and understanding of wing technologies and aerodynamics, given composite production and Boeing, and both Airbus, Boeing, have, have realized this, they can get far more out of 
a wing built of composites than they could in the old days. It's lighter, its lift drag characteristics are much better. So they need to bring these together into medium short haul mm -hmm. aircraft rather than keep on banging on about derivatives. Well, just a point on, on, on derivatives. So obviously, uh, we have the challenge around us at the moment about the Boeing 737 MAX, which you know, the, the 737s are mm. uh, a trusty aircraft that's been around over 50 years, but currently giving Boeing its biggest ever uh, challenge uh, in terms of uh, customer relations, traveling public, indeed pilot force. Uh, did that take you by surprise in terms of a way things are, are are playing out at the moment with a max grounding after two tragic accidents in, a ver in the very early stages of this aircraft's career? Well, obviously, it caught us all by surprise. Yeah. Um, I, I um, uh, you know, Boeing is uh, a company that has an outstanding record, not just on safety, but on technology and improving outstanding aircraft. Oh, well, we, we've been flying them for I don't know how long now. For those of us <laughs> were in in the 50s and the 60s, Boeing were out there with their Strata cruisers, then the Jet A to 707. These aircraft were uh, game changers, mm -hmm. and Boeing has always been at the front of this. Um, I I I have my views with regard to the continuation of derivative designs, um, and that applies to both sides of the Atlantic, not yeah. just not just Boeing. But in terms of, of what has happened with regard to the MAX, hugely unfortunate. Um, I think Gaith was saying yesterday that, and I believe this, Boeing will sort it uh, and, and get this done. Um, and that'll, that'll happen sooner rather than later in terms of what they're offering. Whether the regulatory authorities across the, across the world will accept that and want to do their own tests may uh, cause a slowdown in production. Will it come back to market in its current form? Yes, it would help. I think the President of the United States says it needs a, a rebranding. Re um, but it's a 737. The 737 has an outstanding track record. Boeing has a great record in terms of um, what it does. I've had first-hand experience of the way the Federal Aviation Administration has delegated regulatory power and authority to Boeing people. And I can say quite safely that they are extremely difficult to deal with when they wear the FAA hat on. There is no way that you can um, overrule them, out, hoodwink them if you like. They are absolute zealots when it comes to performing to the FAA requirements. Now, in c the case of the MAX, I don't know quite what happened there. I'm sure time will reveal it, but I am confident that what they did, although that will be now subject to review, by the United States government was of the top quality, so it's only time will tell. But essentially, the 737, 200, 300, 500, 700, 800, 900, 800 max, 900 max, this is a long line mm -hmm. of tried and tested aircraft after we go back to the mid-60s. Um, so they'll sort it, and I think they've just got to get over the stigma attached to that aeroplane. Um, but once they've made it safe to fly, it will be safe to fly. Tim, we're running out of time. I've still got a pile of questions theoretically to ask you. Um, just two other important areas. Your own partnership, so you mentioned Gaith just now, Gaith L. Gaith, uh, CEO of Fly Dubai. That seems to be flourishing. Uh, you know, the, these two airlines, uh, Emirates, yourselves, uh, and Fly Dubai, both had very different missions in life and were trading really quite distinctly. But this coming together, where uh, relevant, seems to uh, have been very positive. I, you know, I've seen some of the traffic figures, uh, the new journey uh, permutations available to customers. Tell us the latest on, on that, if you would, Tim. Well, it, 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 you know, when we last spoke, uh, it was early days. Mm -hmm. You're right. There was a certain amount of um, mutual value destruction by continuing to compete against each other and overlap. Uh, I think when uh, we all realized that that had to change and that by complementing each other, the flows of traffic would open. So when we, we got together with uh, Fly Dubai in a far more meaningful manner that the shareholder required us to do, uh, it opened up 100 destinations for us. Um, many of those, of course, we wouldn't fly to anyway, so we were able to 
get the flows going across the network. And uh, the results have been particularly good. Uh, a few months ago, we brought Fly Dubai into the southern terminals, uh, our own terminals, to integrate them far more seamlessly into the, the ground product. That's worked very well, and we'll do more of that. So I think in the, in the next few years, you'll see uh, Fly Dubai and Emirates being a far more integrated entity, retaining their own brands, doing not their own thing, but they will still be working independently in certain areas, but certainly joined at the hip in many of the others. Now, I was going to say that that's got to be an important point about working independently because uh, certainly, uh, as, uh, as you and I have both seen in Europe, there have been traditional airlines or legacy airlines who've created their own low cost, almost in their own image. And then yeah. just as the adolescence is beginning to find its way, they've suffocated it, brought it completely yes. back in. I'm not suggesting that uh, uh, Emirates uh, is in that same category, but the way of running a low cost can be quite different. And uh, we've talked about Emirates being a nimble airline, a fleet of foot, but it is different. So you wouldn't want to maybe lose uh, some of the new approaches that they've, no, you, you, they've you, brought. Maybe look, add them into Emirates' own uh, I, I think that's right. Our, d our DNA has to remain as it always has been. Mm. Uh, we've got to drive this business forward. Uh, we've got to innovate. We've got to uh, continue to attract the business, not only business that's been traveling with us but uh, others we've got to deal with the competitive nature there's a huge amount of catch-up that's gone on in the last 10 15 years on product uh, so we've had to keep on uh, there is something we love doing I mean uh, personally I, I just spend hours and hours trying to think of new products for the cabins and the, the ground etc etc it's hugely interesting in terms of Fly Dubai, you've, you've got a bit of a hybrid low cost mm -hmm. because they have a very good, good business, business class product. They have yeah. life flat beds, right. which when the two came together, it was far more easy to market and price and bring the commercial marketing teams together to make these two aircraft work completely uh, airlines seamlessly. At the same time, they, can do the, they do their own thing. The brand of Fly Dubai is particularly strong in the region, and I'm quite sure that's going to expand as we do. So, all good stuff at the moment. And you have a big partnership. I mean, there's more partnerships coming along, but Qantas is into its second iteration, second five-year period. Now, some media coverage will suggest, oh, well, it's, you know, it's over because Qantas is now flying non-stop Perth, London. But, of course, while that seems to be working very well for them, it's a small aircraft. It's a 787, which they put on in place of a 380, the Heathrow. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't really sum up the relationship, does it, uh, in terms well, of it, uh, the it, dynamics of the benefits to both, you know, both when parties? I remember when Alan Joyce and I sat with the teams, oh, about 2012, we were talking about the way Qantas was going about its international mm -hmm. operation, and it was giving him huge problems. At the time, he'd been to Malaysia to try and get a, a deal with the Malaysians, latterly Singapore, and so we appeared on the scene. I remember saying to him, and one day... Alan, there will be wide body twins flying that you will be able to reach. A bit like that, you know, lager advert. Parts of Europe that others will not be able to yeah. reach. Um, and I, in those days, I had in mind the 7778, which I believe would be able to operate Sydney to the southern European points, possibly even Paris and Frankfurt without, without stopping. More recently, the 787 came to market. Um, and that has done exactly what we said would happen. And he kind of liked that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're right. They, they constrained their capacity by putting a 232-seater on Perth, London, serving Melbourne behind it. So the automatic, a lot of the business that was on that, what was the QF9 and 10, which went over to buy on the 380, shifted to us. Well, thank you very much. We're very happy about that. But don't forget, we have a very close relationship with, with them, which ensures that everybody gets value out of this. Now, when they took their decision to move over Singapore and away from Dubai uh, with the 380 one today and this one going, naturally there was a shift to Emirates, but at the same time, they are our major marketing agent. So all the business that was going on then that came onto us, they took a cut because they sold it through their FFDs, etc. So by doing that, Alan was able to ensure that value still flowed back into Qantas but freed off his 380 capacity to go on the north-south mm -hmm. axis into, you know, the China's, Chinese and Japanese and uh, Asian markets. So it was quite a smart move, and as a result of that, we are able to um, move forward 
um, in a manner such that we've renewed the agreement. Uh, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago uh, just to see how it was all going and everybody's happy. So, so That's far so good. good. Tim, I think probably the last question for me, I and mean, I'm going to take advice whether I can allow a couple of the people in the audience to put a question to you. Uh, you mentioned you, you love looking at product changes, and the, the big one that everybody's waiting for with bated breath is premium economy. Mm -hmm. You've had that in gestation, in your mind, maybe even agonized about it for a long time. Is it a trade down or a trade up? You've decided it's a trade up, and it certainly seems to be becoming more and more money spinner for those airlines who've got it. Where, when do we expect to see that coming into service, and can you say any more about the spec as yet? Or is it still well, under the, wraps? The, um, the, the, the 380s that will be delivered next year will have premium economy in them. The 777s that also come next year will have premium economy in them. We know what we're going to do. We've, we've done all the furniture designs, uh, configuration design, and the product design for that. The question is how you do it and when. Because you, if you have one aeroplane flying around, it's not going to really work. Your distribution systems can't cope with that. So we've got to get a, a, a small number of airlines that allow aircraft that allow us to kind of operate and open, open them on, yeah. on routes that will support that. And we're mm -hmm. looking at that. Certainly by the back end of next year and into 21, the airline will be running through a major rollout of premium economy. And you're absolutely right. We're hoping it doesn't cause, cause a trade down. I believe that it's more likely to cause the trade up. Um, it won't, have, of course, have flat beds or anything like that. So for a business uh, passenger to trade his or her flat bed for a sleeper, it may be a bit of an ask, we hope. Uh, the price points of the premium economy will sit above the um, higher echelons of the economy, but well below business. So in the end, we're hoping that it'll work. As you rightly say, others have tried. It's tested and it's worked for them. I see no reason why when Emirates introduces the 380 with premium economy on it, why it shouldn't be another outstanding first. We've even clubized, if you can use that verb, the cabin. So it really looks a piece of work. We've done a lot of work with our friends in Airbus and Boeing using these uh, technologies that I can design the aeroplane using goggles. Right. Um, and using and the virtual reality, gay, virtual, gay virtual gay reality yeah. so we can actually get carpet fiber textures and seat covers, leather, et cetera, wood grain into the system. So in the end, you've got the cabin in front of you. You take the goggles off and you're standing in a room with nothing in it. It's hilarious. <laughs> so Tim, there we are. I'm just going to take guidance. Uh, Lucy, is Lucy around? Uh, can I take, uh, where's Lucy? Can I, got to finish. One question. OK, this gentleman on the front, if somebody could just get a mic very quickly to him. One quick question from the floor. Can you make your question as brief as possible, and just say who you are, if you wouldn't mind? Yeah, sure. Uh, great work, conversation. Alex Rain is my name, and two issues that you did not cover, Etihad and the DWC, move to DWC in the future. And uh, what about Etihad? What, uh, what scenarios, what future do you see with Etihad and um, your relationship with Etihad going forward? Well, I, I, I think we have made our position quite clear, as has Etihad. These are two independent airlines operating to uh, a set of rules that their shareholders will decide what they want to do. In the case of Itihad, uh, I'm not really going to speak on behalf of Tony Douglas, but he has a new set of rules that he is designing the airline to. Uh, there is a degree of cooperation in areas that we think will be of mutual benefit. The notion that the two airlines should come together and do all the other bits and pieces, uh, this was a media um, hair starting to run simply because we were talking um, about the way we might deal with fleet in the future and other bits and pieces like that. So um, that's one thing. As far as Dubai World Central is concerned, the government has already finished the expansion of the first phase. The new uh, terminal was built and it's now ready to go. At the moment, we've got a number of carriers operating there because of the su Southern Runway shutdown. And I think as time moves on, that more of that will be, be, be uh, used. In terms of the master plan for the big airport, I think that will probably slip into the late 20s, early 30s. Um, I think much will depend on the way Fly Dubai and Emirates come together with this plan that I was mentioning earlier, 
and seeing how that will, will uh, fit in what we have today and what the overspill requirements will be going forward. But in the end, it's a government of Dubai decision as to what they want to do. Tim, it's always a pleasure to speak to you. Never enough time, at least from my point of view, to uh, keep you uh, energized and uh, sharing your knowledge and experience with us. So, Tim, thanks very much. Ladies You're and welcome. gentlemen, Sir Tim Clark, President of Emirates. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so John. Much, Tim.